Um, so I want to uh, get to Harsha very soon, but um, I just want to kind of link what we've been talking about so far, which has been either largely visual or auditory. Uh, so far we've been talking about visual representations of the city and we've been talking about how sound helps us navigate the city. Um, today Harsha is going to be our first um, literary scholar and looking very carefully at texts and words. Um, and so in that context, I thought it'd be interesting to think about our, our word of the day as text. Um, and thinking about the fact that it comes from the same root as, that gives us textile, texture, it implies something woven, which takes us back to our uh, word map, when we were talking about plan, map originally was about a piece of textile, a napkin, it has the same root as napkin. So a text is something that we think of in two dimensions and something woven, but actually as we were talking about with Georgina Cleage, a story is quite a linear thing, and a text is quite a linear thing. It happens to be um, in, in a book form because our eyes have trouble following. You know, you could read a novel as just one long ticker tape, really. There's a linear aspect to stories. Um, so I think that that's just something useful to think about spatially. Um, the, the linearness of narrative also takes us into the fourth dimension of time. So when we're, we're thinking about cities, that are three and four dimensional places, we often flatten them out into plans, into two dimensions. Maybe we can find some ways of representing them in three dimensions, but ironically, it's the kind of one dimensional linear narrative that is what stories are made of that helps us get into the fourth dimension of time. Um, I also just wanted to um, you know, talk about how we all use literature to understand cities. So when we think of you know, even if we are not students of literature, you think of 19th century London, you have to think of Dickens. Um, and especially in the 19th century, novels were so important to understanding the cities then and now. And so, you know, there's a long tradition of looking at Dickens, Dostoevsky, and Balzac as um, representers of cities through novels at a time when novel, the novel perhaps was at its peak of influence as a form. Um, and so today, as we're looking at cities, it was very interesting when I was talking with folks who were teaching about uh, southern China, I said, you know, they're talking a lot about migration, and so a lot of the 19th century novels in Europe were about migration. They're about, you know, ambitious young men from the provinces going to Paris, going to London, going to the, the capital, and that's the same thing that's happening in China now. You know, the protagonist might be a young woman going to work in a factory in Shenzhen or whatever. And I said, so what are the great novels? Who are the, you know, uh, the, uh, the Julian Sorrells and, you know, the, the protagonists of novels in this parallel uh, thing that's going on in China? But the China specialist said, you know, it's happening more in film, really. It's not happening in novels. Um, they have people coming up with, like, the emblematic novel. But text is still important, and so words are still portraying this migration, but it might be through the equivalent of tweets or social media or cell phone novels, which started in Japan but are popular in China and are, they're, they're serially published like as Dickens was. So anyway, um, you know, these texts, these stories are an important way of understanding cities just as, um, just as maps and art and the other things we've been looking at more. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Harsha Ram, who teaches um, in Catholic and um, Slavic language and literature. Uh, his interests are very wide-ranging, not only Russian, but Georgian literature, Italian, modern Indian. Uh, he's very geographically diverse. Um, and he's interested in aesthetic theory, comparative poetics, genre theory, literary history. So one thing I think will be interesting to hear whether you're going to talk about uh, literature as evidence or literature as a piece of art that you study. I think that um, it's useful to us in studying cities in both senses. Um, his most uh, recent book is The Imperial Sublime, A Russian Poetics of Empire. And his forthcoming book will be called Crossroads, Modernity, Aesthetic Modernism, and the Russian Georgian Encounter. And so since we're all very interested in peripheries and hybridity, um, I think Russia's talk will be very interesting. And look, it's, it's going to be auditory, 
and it's going to be textual. Uh, yes. And no pictures. Right? Actually, there's a picture in the hand. Oh, yeah, but it's a picture you can hold in your hand, right? Uh, there is, in fact, a handout, and I think some of you came in a little bit late, so let me just quickly see the opportunity to pass this around again. Um, I think the people are scattered all over, but maybe you could put your hands up. And could you pass these around? Thank you. Thank you. Um, keep your hands up so that we know where you're, where you're sitting. Hopefully we'll get to the text. Um, so uh, I, I come here with a kind of confession, which is that, in fact, I'm not at all a trained scholar of the city. Uh, nor indeed of Georgia or of the Caucasus region, which, uh, and in fact I have become essentially willy-nilly firstly a sort of a scholar of the region, and then somewhat to my own surprise, uh, someone deeply interested in the city, partly because it was always, cities have always been where I felt most comfortable, uh, the anomie and, and the sort of the, the, the possibilities of reinvention that cities afford, but also because uh, it became a more, uh, uh, increasingly evident to me that I, I didn't want to write a book just about, um, in, in my case, the Russians, the, 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 the Russian there, you know, encountering the plucky Georgian underdog. Uh, a book that would have been essentially about, if you like, the geopolitics of the region, seen through a kind of literary prism. What I discovered when I went to the Georgian capital, which today is called Tbilisi, but in fact which was called Tiflis, in most languages other than Georgian until 1936, um, was that in fact the city itself was a fascinating space and one that in many ways was richer and deeper than the binary encounter that took place between the Russians as colonizers and the Georgians as the colonized. And so essentially as I began to travel to Georgia since uh, the year 2000, um, I discovered, in fact, essentially something that I had already known, of course, from my readings of Russian literature, which is that Georgia, in many ways, was the jewel in the Russian imperial crown, not unlike, say, India vis-à-vis -vis the Russian Empire. And many of the uh, cultural, uh, um, political, economic, um, and civilizing aspects of the Russian co uh, colonial mission, if you like, uh, have some interesting parallels with those of other overseas empires, such as Britain or France. Um, or, or uh, Spain. And in that sense, I hope that some of what I'm going to be saying to you about Tbilisi, a city that probably very few of you have heard of or, or thought much about, could also, with some you know, uh, mutations, uh, be applied to many other so-called peripheral cities, uh, non-Western cities, cities that are in a sense not considered metropolitan, either in terms of size or, or economic uh, power. Um, uh, What's also interesting about uh, Tiflis or Tbilisi is that in many ways it becomes the object of, if you like, a kind of double civilizing mission. Both its, its recent modern history straddles both 19th century colonialism, Russian colonialism, but also uh, 20th century Soviet communism. So in fact, its transformations have been multiple and uh, truly profound. Um, it's an ancient city. It was founded, at least according to more or less legend, in the 5th century uh, CE. Uh, it was the capital of the Georgian Kingdom during the High Middle Ages, and then was burned to the ground by the, by the Persians in 1795, and then was essentially rebuilt almost from scratch uh, in the 19th century as the colonial administrative capital of uh, uh, the Trans-Caucasian region, that's the, the region sandwiched between Turkey, what is today Turkey, Iran, and the Caucasus Mountains. Um, Interestingly, it, it becomes a definitively Georgian city in demographic terms only after World War II. Um, during the 19th century, the population swells from 11,000 in the mid-19th century to 159,000 in 1897. Today, it has the population of around 1.2 million in a country of around 4.5 million people. So we're talking about relatively, uh, let's say, modest city. Um, but one that in fact has enormous cultural, political, and economic significance for its own Transcaucasian region. But in fact, I also wanted to, in a sense, ask this larger question. How do we talk about cities other than New York, Los Angeles, Berlin, Vienna, Paris, London, right? In other words, how do we talk about uh, cities other than metropolises? And how, how do we talk about cities other than those in which something like a metropolitan experience of modernity has apparently been forged? Yes? We are so used to thinking of modernity as A, urban, B, industrial, and, and C, western. And, and, and in that sense, it seems to me that Tbilisi, like in fact most cities in Africa, Asia, 
uh, uh, and elsewhere, are in fact neither Western nor particularly heavily industrialized, at, at least until recently, and yet have had a profound experience of modernity. Yes, and in fact, in many ways, can be seen as somehow having constituted in some aspects of some aspects of modernity itself. So I'm hoping that my book is not going to, in a sense, become lost in a uh, bookshelf of. Georgian studies where practically nobody will look at it, but rather be useful to many people um, who are thinking about smaller cities, so-called peripheral cities, uh, and cities that in some ways don't fit into certain kinds of regional or civilizational uh, paradigms such as East and West. In fact, I want to suggest that I'm dealing with two big dilemmas in this book, and I'm going to call them the geographical dilemma and then the historical dilemma. The geographical dilemma is I think both fairly simple and yet quite profound and difficult. Uh, Tbilisi, or Tiflis as it was called, was in, on the one hand the center of a region, and that region was called, the Russians called it Transcaucasia, today it's often called Caucasia or South Caucasus. Um, but this region, so the South Caucasus, was itself a borderland, a kind of periphery, and interestingly a periphery of not one, but in fact multiple regions. It's a periphery of the former Russian Empire, what is now called the Soviet Union or Russia, Eurasia. It is a periphery also of the Near East, specifically Iran to the southeast, uh, Turkey or the Ottoman Empire, and Byzantium and, and the Roman Empire before. In other words, it is on the one hand the center of its own discrete region, but at the same time it is peripheral with respect to multiple regions that were constantly being constituted, destroyed, and reconstituted as, as, as uh, world empires. Um, and that puts it in a particularly kind of interesting place because it's impossible, to put it very simply, to talk about a city that is neither Eastern nor Western, right? um, but rather that combines elements of multiple cultural, linguistic, ethnic, uh, civilizational systems. Is it even a peripheral city? Right? In fact, there have been some geographers and historians of Transcaucasia who argue, in fact, that the South Caucasus is not, in fact, so much a periphery, but rather a kind of inter-imperial uh, uh, space that is constantly being uh, reconquered and reconstituted depending on the ebb and flow of uh, receding and advancing boundaries and armies. Um, um, so in that sense, I've, I've, one of the, the reasons, in fact, that my book is originally going to be called something like peripheral modernity. Uh, and then, in fact, I changed it to crossroads. In fact, it's now called city of crossroads. And although I'm not going to be able to talk about the idea of crossroads in great details today, because I'm going to talk about a lot of other things, including hopefully the poem, uh, um, that's it. I found, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of crossroads as being a kind of an alternative to the core periphery or center periphery model that is so um, pervasive in world systems theory, in different kinds of uh, economic and socio-economic and political models of modernity, where, whereby uh, the center is generally equated with the West, that is to say Europe and the transatlantic, and the periphery is essentially the non-West which receives modernity either as a curse or as a gift, right? including of course all of the problems and challenges of development and modernization. Um, and uh, what I'm trying to do is in a sense get outside the bind of a center-periphery dichotomy by thinking about Tbilisi or Tiflis as a kind of crossroads city that is a conduit for, com for commerce, uh, and in fact a long-standing conduit that goes back really to, the, uh, to antiquity. Um, so in, uh, a, a conduit for commerce, it's also a, an administrative colonial and regional capital, uh, and it's also a conduit for ideas and people and goods and commodities moving on a, a broadly north-south axis between Iran, um, uh, Russia, and Europe, including France. So in fact, ideas as well as goods, for everything from revolution to silk, right, uh, uh, are constantly moving, uh, and people are constantly moving up and down along this, uh, 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 this corridor or crossroads, uh, which makes Tbilisi something of a kind of a link city between also Islam and, uh, and, and the European or Christian West. Um, the historic, uh, I should also emphasize that in terms of the geographical dilemma of Tbilisi, uh, that's something that's also, in a sense, demographically highlighted by the population of the city itself. Um, in, uh, in fact, in the 19th century, Armenians, rather than Georgians, consistently and often overwhelmingly outnumbered Georgians uh, uh, in the city itself. 
and they constituted the dominant community both numerically and economically. Uh, and this means, of course, that Tbilisi has a kind of an awkward, even a barren status in the Georgian national narrative. Uh, which is why, in fact, there are relatively few books written in Georgian about Tbilisi, particularly in the 19th century, because, in fact, it's essentially an Armenian city for the entire period that I'm primarily interested in it, which is, of course, both fascinating and a huge headache for me because I don't know Armenian, although I do have Russian and Georgian. Um, the second dilemma that I wanted to pose before you is, in fact, uh, the first one being the geographical one. Where does uh, how to locate uh, ge uh, Tbilisi geographically? The second is how to locate Tbilisi historically. Uh, and by this I mean the following. So much of the scholarly literature in the city, and I'm sure you know this literature far better than I do because I'm not a city's uh, scholar uh, primarily, uh, that is to say that scholarly literature that focuses on urban development and modernization generally associates development and modernization with industrial capitalism, right? Uh, as it emerges in the late 18th century in London and certainly takes off in a big way by the mid-19th century elsewhere. And that raises a question, how does one talk about a city like Tiflis, and indeed so many other cities in the world, in which modernity is not associated primarily with industry or with a capitalist market, right? um, and, but rather with a colonial state, with cultural agents such as national or regional intelligentsias, and also older social groups, such as merchant communities, uh, who, whose origins often lie in the pre-modern era. Right? Uh, and so, what do we do with these vestigial, so-called vestigial remnants, and I use the word in, in quotation marks, of older cultural uh, uh, and historical formations that persist into the 19th and 20th century, but which, do, which don't fit easily into any kind of narrative of modernity or capitalism as modernity. So my book's thesis, and I'm going to give this to you in like one paragraph, um, is the following, that in fact, and, and by the way, it's not a profoundly original thesis, it's been uh, already pursued by various literary, uh, uh, literary historians as well as historians proper. Um, um, I'm thinking of Perry Anderson, the historian, Frederick Jameson, the literary scholar, and so forth. And my thesis is basically that um, um, it is precisely the condition of uneven modernity, that is to say, a modernity in which the modern coexists alongside what is often nostalgically or dismissively termed a pre-modern, that is in fact in many ways the constitutive condition of modernity and which is particularly evident in the so-called periphery, where the pre-modern often survives in a more vivid and powerful way, uh, which cannot be dismissed as simply a vestigial remnant of the past that is destined to be swept aside. So I want to suggest that cities uh, in the so-called, in what used to be called the third world or the global south, in many ways represent perhaps the most vivid uh, experience we have of modernity, precisely in its unevenness. And far from being uneven, it's far from being a kind of deficient con condition, that is to say, of incomplete modernization, of a development that has yet to happen, I want to suggest, in fact, that this unevenness is perhaps precisely what we need to look at as what constitutes uh, being modern, that is to say, straddling multiple spaces and multiple times, and these spaces and times get concentrated in some very powerful way in the urban fabric. Right, perhaps more dramatically than in the countryside. So um, one way in which I've, you know, I was, I've been reading a great deal about cities, but also a great deal about world systems theory, core periphery oppositions, uh, the history of global capitalism, and I consistently came across the problem of how to talk about um, place in opposition to space. Right? I suspect that this is a, a problem that may have come up in this course before. Uh, space is, extra, is very often associated with various forms of abstraction, including the abstraction of that which we cannot see or touch or feel, which would include, of course, the planet as a whole, the globe, right? And processes that are in many ways intangible and yet at the same time um, powerful, like globalization, right? Um, and one of the ways in which I thought I could deal, overcome the sort of the inertia of the center periphery opposition was by setting up a kind of an alternative tension between what Henri Lefebvre, the great ge geographer and theoretician of space, calls espace and lieu, that is to say space and place. Um, and it seems to me in many ways that it's by moving away from some of the big abstractions, that is to say space understood as um, what gives rise to such things as the spatial representations and codifications of cartographers, town planners, technocrats, scholars on the one hand, and place, which I would suggest is something we can associate with that which is sensuously lived, yes? 
uh, embodied place, right? And which, for example, Lefebvre, as well as uh, uh, um, others, have, like such as Michel de Certeau, have linked to what they call the clandestine and subterranean side of social life. Right? So uh, my book, in many ways, is, going, is trying to negotiate, on the one hand, between these larger abstractions, uh, abstractions that we associate with politics of empire, for example, uh, um, uh, economic, uh, you know, economic trade, um, history understood as a sort of an overarching arc of time, and the idea of lived and sensual space as something that is inhabited but also transformed by the citizens or denizens of the city. Um, and it leads to, I think, what, what, is, what I hope is not purely an entirely romantic tension between, on the one hand, a, a kind of instrumentalist understanding of the city, right, as that which has to be manipulated, controlled, governed, uh, uh, cleaned, cleaned up, right, uh, on the one hand, and uh, a kind of more, if you like, uh, aesthetic and less functionalist understanding of the city as sensuously lived in places such as, for example, streets, gardens, squares, taverns, uh, uh, public bathhouses, marketplaces, and so forth. And in fact, Tbilisi, what's one of the interesting things about Tbilisi, and I hope to get to that uh, after so little time, right? I hope to get to that, is that um, Tbilisi is actually both a trading city, an administrative city, but also, interestingly, a city of uh, a very consciously cultivated forms of leisure, uh, play, the arts, specifically bardic poetry, minstrelsy, music, um, as well as um, uh, uh, the favorite pastime of the peoples of the region, which is heavy drinking. Uh, and in fact, wine, uh, Georgians consider their own region to have been the very birthplace of viticulture, wine growing. And in fact, a great deal of the cultural production, including the literary production that interests me, uh, is actually, uh, they're actually wine, uh, they're drinking songs, or songs that were, or poetry that was um, designed to be sung at various kinds of festive occasions. And in the 19th century, those festive occasions ranked something like two or three times a week. Right? Um, and so, in many ways, I want, and one of the things I'm trying to think about is the way in which uh, the city as text is, in some ways, produced in these not simply written practices, but also oral, festive, sung, lyric, bardic practices, right? uh, and which in many ways constitute the popular culture of the city, uh, often in opposition to or in a critique of um, uh, the, the ruling elites. And keep in mind that in this case, the ruling elites were multiple, that is to say you have a Russian colonial elite, right? which is imposing a kind of Russophone European uh, model of culture and civilization on the city. Um, and, but also the Georgian elites, which, were, uh, which was relatively uh, restricted in the 19th century, as well as the Armenian merchant class, uh, which con constitutes a kind of proto-capitalist class in, in, the 19th, in 19th century Georgia. So um, I'm basically, uh, I don't think I'm going to read, actually. I'll, I'll try to avoid uh, reading, but I'm just going to go through a few pages of the chapter that I was actually writing uh, this summer, which was actually the hardest chapter to write, uh, this is a hint for those of you who are working on dissertations or soon to do so, um, uh, I decided to do something perhaps foolish, which was to write the theory chapter at the beginning. Uh, um, because I had to figure out what I was doing and, how, and what the framework was. Uh, and one of the things I find, and perhaps others do as well, is that it's so much easier to do ethnographic or you know, basically field work than it is to sit back and try and think about the relationship between the, uh, the material or embodied or physical world that you've been studying and the theory or the descriptive model that you're using to understand it. Um, so that's the, the section that I'm going to be, in a sense, addressing. I, I really, what I'm going to be talking about in this first section is how to talk about a city like Tbilisi, which, is, which seems to fall short of all the markers of urban modernity, right? and yet at the same time is profoundly engaged in making the modern, the modern era. Um, a Georgian poet by the name of Tizian Tabidze hailed modernity uh, as a historical experience and modernism as an aesthetic uh, cultural project as a child of the city. And he said the following. He said, um, uh, London, New York, and Hamburg are where smokestacks are taller than temples, where automobiles rush rapidly about, and where rows of zeppelins 
gather ready for flight. This is written in 1916, one year before the Russian Revolution. Now, needless to say, uh, Tbilisi had boasted neither uh, smokestacks taller than temples, there were relatively few uh, uh, cars, and certainly no zeppelins in 1916. In other words, a Georgian poet like Titian Tabidze, in celebrating modernity, seems to be constantly looking towards Europe and specifically, oh, the, let's say the transatlantic world, as a model for how to be modern. Right? And, and clearly, according to this model, Georgia and Tbilisi fall short. Um, indeed, until the very end of the 19th century, the economy of Tiflis was largely dominated by pre-industrial, artisanal, and small-scale manufacturing, uh, and the commerce in transit commodities that flourished in the bazaars and caravanserais of the old city. And I'm going to make, uh, give you two quotes from two, I think, fairly celebrated Marxist thinkers as well as leaders, one from Lenin and then Stalin. And you, you are probably aware that the 20th century is probably the second most notorious dictator uh, after Hitler. Stalin was, in fact, Georgian and spent a brief amount of time in Tbilisi uh, before the Russian Revolution uh, engaged in uh, uh, petty, th uh, basically, armed robbery. Right? Armed robbery, however, in, in the name of revolution. Um, and Lenin before him, in his famous book, The Development of Capitalism in Russia, 1899, says the following. The economic conquest of the Caucasus was accomplished much later than the political and remains incomplete to this day. In other words, the, 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 the region of Georgia is annexed into the Russian Empire in 1801, but in fact, the, the economic conquest uh, was essentially incomplete even 100 years later. In other words, the Russian model of conquest of Transcaucasia was in almost the exact inverse of, say, the British uh, East India Company's actions, for example, in Bengal or elsewhere in India, where it was first a commercial enterprise and then only became a political colonial one. In the case of, the Transca uh, of uh, Transcaucasia and Tbilisi, it's precisely the opposite. It's political and military first and really doesn't become economic. In fact, the region doesn't even become economically beneficial to the empire practically ever. Right? In, to this day, for example, the North Caucasus is, is a drain on the Russian budget. Right? It doesn't bring very much to uh, uh, Russia at all, uh, which raises questions as to why the Russians continue to cling to the region to this day. Um, Lenin continues, he says, the age-old native co cottage industries are being slowly squeezed out by competition from manu manufactured goods imported from Moscow, such that Russian capitalism is drawing the Caucasus into the global circulation of com commodities, right? erasing its local particularities, the vestiges, and this is the part I want to underline, the vestiges of ancient patriarchal isolation. Now, I would suggest that Lenin's um, observation uh, is both brilliant and typically limited, and in its limitations are typical of 19th century Marxism. Right? On the one hand, Lenin very astutely points out the fact that uh, local industries are being eroded, and specifically pre-industrial forms of production, uh, by uh, goods that are, being, that are flooding the region from uh, Russian industry. On the other hand, he says basically local particularities are being inevitably uh, erased. In other words, culture, from a Marxist point of view, appears to be um, uh, largely irrelevant to the inroads of a uh, modernization process that is both inevitable, inexorable, and all-consuming. Right? Now, uh, what I'm going to suggest, in fact, that while certainly I take <laughs> Marx seriously, that the cultural text of a city, in fact, in many ways, uh, constitutes not simply its specificity, but also its modes of adaptation as well as resistance. Right? And the fact that Tbilisi was not an industrial city, Baku to the east was the major, in Azerbaijan, was the major oil producing center in uh, the Caucasus region. In fact, was the major oil producing region, uh, city in the world in the late 19th century. Tbilisi remains pre-industrial, uh, 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 art, uh, focused on artisanal production, uh, transit commodity trade, as well as its function as a cultural and administrative uh, capital. Now, um, now, I want to suggest, in fact, that if it is true that Tbilisi is largely, or Tiflis in the 19th century is largely untouched by um, industry and by capitalism as the main engine of modernization, I want to suggest that we still need to look at other kinds of cultural, socioeconomic phenomena that would allow us to think about Tbilisi or any so-called peripheral or non-Western city as being profoundly implicated in the process of modernity and the experience of modernity. Right? Um, 
In the 19th century, for example, colonial Tiflis was a city that was, uh, while it didn't mirror the spatial structures of a modern urban industrial metropolis, uh, was profoundly touched by modernization. It was a city stratified, profoundly stratified by ethnicity, legal estate, occupation, bureaucratic rank, dominated on the one hand by colonial administration, but also uh, um, um, uh, by various ethnic groups, the Armenians, the Georgians, um, Germans, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, Muslim communities, both Azeri Shia as well as Iranian, uh, as well as uh, Tur Turkish proper communities. So we have essentially a complex urban fabric that is, uh, that is divided ethnically uh, on the basis of ethnicity, faith, uh, legal estate, uh, dominated overall by a Russian colonial administration that is increasingly incapable of governing uh, and con or controlling the aspirations of, on the one hand, a restless uh, um, populace, urban populace, but also the aspirations of the national elites, the Georgians, the Armenians, who are at times cooperating with each other, at times at loggerheads with each other, yes, uh, and at times also at loggerheads with the Russian administration at various points, particularly by the early 20th century, uh, in leading to general strikes, uh, uh, increasing urban violence that culminates in the revolutions of 1905, which uh, has a profound impact on Georgia, uh, uh, and then 1917 again, where uh, the Russian Empire effectively collapses. Um, now, what's interesting also about um, Tbilisi is, in fact, that the, the, I mentioned very briefly the, the, um, the city is being divided, is that, in fact, this, these divisions, uh, ethnicity, uh, legal estate, class, and so forth, suggest a kind of urban fabric that, in many ways, is characterized by hybridity and multiplicity and diversity, yes? At the same time, uh, the Russian colonial administration, starting in the mid-19th century, does something which uh, becomes, in fact, is part of a familiar pattern that uh, recurs in many parts of Asia, uh, 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 North Africa and elsewhere, which is a division of the city into a European quarter and a so-called Asiatic quarter. Yes, um, This begins to happen in the middle of the 19th century. The uh, European quarter is characterized by uh, uh, rectilinear boulevards on a kind of Russo-French model, uh, and with, with neoclassical administrative and cultural uh, edifices along, uh, you know, lining both sides of the street. And in fact, the poem that I have distributed uh, uh, describes one flaneur or stroller walking down this particular street, uh, which was called Golovinsky Avenue in the 19th century and Rustavelli Avenue in the 20th. I'm sure many of you who study uh, uh, cities in the global south will understand the significance of the, the change of toponyms, yes? The, the redesignation and the nativization of, 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 of the names of streets and squares and, and cities itself. Um, um, so we have, on the one hand, a European city that is dedicated to a new civilizing model, uh, which is both Russian and European, and which creates a kind of facade city, right, um, in which the, you know, the, 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 the march of imperial progress can be, in some ways, architecturally and spatially mapped. On the other hand, you have what is called the Asiatic city. Now, what's interesting about the Asiatic city is that, Asiatic city is that to some extent, it's largely destroyed in the late 18th century by the Persians in 1797. Um, but it's more or less reconstituted along the ruins, and it's essentially a kind of haunted space. Right? It, it's, a, it's a haunted space in the sense that it looks back onto the pre-modern, uh, and specifically uh, and from descriptions of both Persian and European travelers to pre-modern Tiflis, we get a sense that it was essentially a kind of garden city modeled, uh, loosely speaking, on Safavid um, Iranian uh, Isfahan, Persian Isfahan. Um, and in many ways, it's this garden city with its marketplaces, caravanserais, camels, uh, 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 goods being brought from, uh, from, the, from the Near East, that creates a certain kind of ethnographic uh, uh, picturesque eth ethnographic backdrop for the modernizing process, the civilizing, Europeanizing process that takes place over the course of the 19th century. So one of the things, um, I've got about three minutes, right, before, if we want to, you know what I'm going to do, I'm just going to talk a little bit more and then we'll just read the poem and have a conversation. 
Um, uh, I've, I have 20 more pages, but I obviously not going to um, Where was I? Um, oh, yes, the ethnography. Uh, so it's this picturesque um, realm of the Asiatic city that constitutes essentially the um, ethnographic curiosity that draws travelers, writers, poets, Russians, Frenchmen, everybody goes to Tbilisi, and everybody notices three or four or five things. Right? They notice the sharp contrast between the civilized European quarter, right? which they, which they speak in, but are not terribly interested in describing, except, except as a, either successful or failed example of Russian civilization. If they're French, it's generally a failure. If it's Russian, it's generally a success. Um, if, but when they go into the popular quarter of the city, what they discover are taverns, um, uh, uh, caravanserais, um, um, an extraordinary panoply of dress, ethnicity, languages being spoken uh, from all over the Near East. Uh, and it essentially becomes a kind of a melting pot space. And I use that word unhappily. Um, but one that they are unable to really engage in except in, through sort of basically 18th, 19th century aesthetics of the picturesque. Right? Um, and one of the things I'm trying to think about in my book is how to resurrect um, a lost city, in a sense, or a city that, whose cultural uniqueness has been largely eroded, uh, not simply by, by capital, not so much by capitalism, but in this case, in fact, by communism, right? Um, without falling back into the cliches of the picturesque, right? Of doing a traditional kind of ethnography of people wearing strange and exotic clothes and doing strange and exotic things, right? Um, now, one archive that I found particularly precious is the archive of these minstrels, um, who in fact were deeply connected to the workaday life of the popular classes of the city. Um, in other words, the relationship between leisure and work was in some ways profoundly connected. It wasn't so much that leisure was something you did to um, contrast with work, but rather you actually pursued your leisure activities with the members of your own craft guild or traders uh, guild, yes? And these guilds were, so, were, were constituted on the basis not so much of ethnicity or religion, but on the basis, obviously, of, of work. So you have essentially a kind of often um, uh, um, sort of an ethnically and religiously diverse community of generally men gathering in the, in the gardens and taverns of the city to do three things. To eat, to feast, to toast. Actually, that's more than three already. <laughs> Two more things. To, to get drunk. And to, uh, um, and to recite poetry and to sing. And so this brings me to the text that I wanted to share with you since... Um, do we even have time for that? Sure. What do you think? Yeah? Okay. Uh, and I don't think I have a copy. I think I gave all... I mean, oh, no, I do. I do. It's good. Thank you. <laughs> now, let me fi fill you in because, in fact, this poem, if it's properly understood, and it would take about 20 minutes at least to do so, but let you go. This poem is written by a Russian-speaking Armenian native to Tbilisi. So even though the poem is written in, in Russian, he, the poet himself was not ethnically Russian, but was Armenian and a Russified Armenian, right? Uh, or commenting on a city in 1914 that, that is his native city, but in a language that is the, the language of modernity, the language uh, of, the, of the colonizer, if you will, but one that is isn't in, largely internalized. And uh, what I want to suggest is that, that Yevangulov, is his name, is an elite uh, writer, right, who encounters a particular, a particular, a quintessential phenomenon of urban, 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century urban Tbilisi, which is the Kinto, right? The Kinto is a petty trader, right, who uh, would walk this, uh, and, and who was more known, less known for what he sold, although, as you can see from his basket, uh, the basket he's carrying on his head, he was mainly a fruit vendor, a fruit seller, right? Uh, but he was known less for what he sold than for the way he spoke, the way he sang, the way he uh, uh, bargained, and, uh, and for the way he dressed. Notice his baggy trousers, right, for example, and for a certain kind of carefree insouciance of, of, of delivery. In other words, the Kinto was famous for the fact that he didn't really care what he was selling, whether he sold anything at all, but rather it was the, the dynamic of social interaction on the street 
between vendor and buyer, or indeed between simply vendor and onlooker, that really characterized the city, not just the Kinto, but in a sense the city as a whole. In other words, the, the, Tbilisi was celebrated in many ways as a kind of a city of leisure and of promenading, of walking, of strolling, and of encounters. Right? And I want to suggest, in fact, that, and this is really the last thing I want to say, and then we'll just take a look at the poem, that, mod that aesthetic or literary or cultural modernism uh, as a phenomenon that we associate with Europe and subsequently with the West is quintessentially associated, many of you may have read Walter Benjamin's work on Paris, for example, right? Is quint quintessentially associated with the, the figure uh, the, called in French the flaneur, the stroller, right? The stroller who functions as a figure both detached and engaged, right? Not quite a part of the marketplace, uh, but rather a witness to the transactions taking place. And Benjamin says that the stroller as poet is the artist who is, in a sense, negotiating this crucial moment where royal or aristocratic patronage for the arts is no longer available, and, but the marketplace is beckoning. And Baudelaire, the quintessential poet Flaneur of the mid-19th century in Paris, is hesitating between this older mode of uh, cultural patronage and the newer world of the capitalist market yeah. within the city. And I want to suggest, in fact, that, I mean, so the, the last question I want to leave with you is, what can we get from Tbilisi that we can't get from Paris? Right? What can we get from the story, the ethnography, the history, and the literature of Tiflis or Tbilisi that we can't get from simply reading Baudelaire or Balzac or Walter Benjamin on, on, on Baudelaire? Right? And I want to suggest that maybe this, this, this poem can tell us something. So let's take a look. Um, where I'll just, shall I just read it in English? We have so little time. Where the day is sunny and long, and where at night one hears the cry make merry, my native city you are dear to me, indolent, festive, Tiflis. On Galadin, or Rustavili Avenue, in the lively stream of civilian dresses and women's coats, I love to encounter him, the healthy, bronze-faced Kinto. He is always happy to adopt the latest buzzwords with, solemn, with great solemnity, as when he sings in a long drawl, Oh, those decadent grapes. And I can explain what that's about if you're interested. Tipsy, and of course everybody in Tbilisi to this day is drunk. Uh, tipsy, endlessly seeking in love with what lasts only an instant, in the free and insouciant Kinto, I see, I see my double. Um, let me stop there, just open it up for questions. I know we have very little time. Thank you so much, Marcia. This was really delightful. And Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, Tbilisi, because it was the, it was the site of a hot springs, mm. right? uh, sulfur springs, uh, and in fact it was always called Tbilisi in Georgia, mm -hmm. but partly I suspect because nobody else could pronounce it. But uh, the, the Tiflis comes actually from from Greek, so presumably it was what the Byzantine Greeks called <coughs> the city, and then it, from Byzant from Byzantine Greek it enters Persian, Arabic, uh, and, and other languages, and then spreads from there to Europe. It's only been called Tbilisi in English since 1936. And yes, you're right, in that, uh, it is about nativization. Mm -hmm. And Stalin, uh, in 1936, establishes that it should be renamed or return, the name should be restored as part of his uh, attempt to create a kind of 
um, nativization of the regions of the constituent republics of the Soviet Union, uh, which was an enormously important project in the 20s and 40s. Yeah. I'm fascinated by um, what you were talking about. Saying about Stalin and, and, and being from Georgia, and yes. I think I've heard that in the past, but not really grasped it right? in terms of this crossroads and inter-imperial mm -hmm. zone. And I'm wondering if anything else has come out of studying this place that um, helps shed an interesting light on, you know, Stalin or Stalinism um, culturally. I think that the connection of Stalin to Georgia is a red herring. Uh, in the sense, that not not because he's, he wasn't Georgian, he was, but because um, Stalin, I think, I mean, like any complex, uh, um, like any complex sociopath, uh, he had many levels, right? And and the and the, the, the deepest level, obviously, was was his Georgian upbringing in a city of Gori, uh, not too far from Tbilisi. Uh, but in fact, fundamentally, Stalin's culture was constituted by. What was it before World War One called social democracy? That is to say, the Marxist international Marxist movement, right? And it's important to remember that in fact, uh, Bolshevik, the Bolshevik <coughs> party of which Stalin was a member, had very little support in Georgia proper, right? Uh, and so, in fact, when Georgia was incorporated into the Soviet Union in 1921-22, it was done militarily. There was no local base uh, for the Bolshevik party, and so in that sense, and I, I don't want to spend more time on this, really, because there's so much else that could be said. I think the relationship of Stalin to Georgia is more of an accident. But um, Ronald Sunni, the historian, is writing a new biography of Stalin. Uh, and uh, he has access to the Georgian archives. And so I expect that he's going to say something, find some interesting things. But what I've discovered so far is that what, mainly what Stalin was up to in Tbilisi was basically bankrupt. And so I'm writing that book. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. Let Susan. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering about the poem. It seems like you're suggesting that um, uh, that this represents another mode of engagement with the city or another mode of narrating that engagement other than the funner. Um, so I was wondering sort of what, what to you that mode was and, and how different it actually is. Okay. Now, that's a great question. In fact, I would have nuanced everything if I had that. Uh, basically, one of the theses of my book is that, in fact, if modernism in Europe, I'm talking here about literary cultural modernism in Europe, is associated with, with a particular social milieu which we call Bohemia, right? which emerges in basically in the 1830s, 1840s in Paris. Right? Uh, a, a, a Bohemian sub, if you like, subclass or a social group that is associated with the tavern and the cafe, right? I want to suggest if we can, um, and that's precisely what Benjamin, for example, studies in his, in his work. And the flaneur, in some ways, is a kind of petty bourgeois bohemian, right? Now, my, my argument is basically the following, that Tiflis offers us an alternative genealogy of bohemia, right? Not, this is not the Parisian bohemia associated with uh, Baudelaire and, and uh, the, the, the accursed poets of the fin de siècle, but rather an, a, a popular bohemia, that's a, a working class bohemia, right? And so when uh, Yevangulov, the, uh, the Russian Armenian poet, is masquerading as Baudelaire, right? Walking through Tbilisi, in some ways thinking of it as Paris, instead of simply encountering as Baudelaire does, the destitute, the rejects of, uh, modern, of Parisian modernization. You, most of you have heard of the process called uh, Osmanisation, right? The the urban uh, the urban redevelopment of the city that involved destruction of the medieval quarters. Um, instead of discovering the destitute of the city, um, what Yevangulov, the poet, discovers is a vital, uh, vivid, still lively, uh, popular culture whose roots go back to the pre-modern era, right? Uh, whose, which but which is still sees itself as a part of a negotiation of the modern, right? It's, in other words, it's not about it's not about the dis destruction and recreation, but rather about a negotiation of the modern. So that, for example, the Kinto, who barely speaks Russian, which is the language of, of the modern in this poem, right, can still say decadent grapes. That is, the grapes, which is the symbol of Georgia going back thousands of years, but decadent, of course, is a term imported via Russia from from France. Right? So it's this idea that the popular uh, can actually negotiate the modern rather than just be crushed by it, is in a sense what I was trying to get. Yeah. 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 Yeah